I'd like to introduce Lord McGregor, uh, Chairman yeah, of the President. Board of President. Yeah. Well, Bruce, yeah. Bruce Russell, the Washington yeah, Jewish, and, and Bill Skelly, and the yeah, Mr. Uh, College here. Yeah. Right. I think possibly you'd like to have us. If we could, Mr. President, if you get right in the middle. Oh, right. Right. Mark. Lord McGregor was just back, sir, from the uh, World uh, Press Freedom Conference in I know. Saint Louis. I know you've been very interested in. Yes, I, I'm amazed at what has happened there with regard to some of our publications, and because uh, we've been friends for many years, and I think he's a great statesman. What what was the shutdown of the you know, cutting down of the numbers of, of the uh, Southeast Asia Wall Street Journal? Well, I, I the general impression that we got is that uh, we kept we kept track. He was not as mentally stable. He He's not as mentally stable as he oh, used to be. That's a shame. He was, was a brilliant. Yeah. He was a very brilliant man in his youth, I know. Now, I know he had a son kind of coming along. Yes, I don't think he's the quality of his father. Now, I was there as part of a delegation from the World Press Freedom Committee here in Washington uh, under the chairmanship of Leonard Marx, who told me that you would twice given him the rank of ambassador. <laughs> uh, and we saw the guy, and we saw the Minister of Information there, yeah, we were to see him, we all knew that he wouldn't see us. But however, your Secretary of State very kindly intervened, yes. and also expressed an opinion. There's the government more than there. that, Wall Street Journal, I understand, for other magazines. Time as well. Yeah. Time magazine, similarly. Lord McGregor has the job of keeping writers on the straight and narrow. Well, <laughs> well, it's a great pleasure to have you. Well, it's a great honor to have met you. Goodbye. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. This is Randy Sanchez from Survivors and Broadcasting Magazine. He's going to slip back here. It's Doug West. Jockey going on up there, and I think it's still, you can still kill it. And, and, you know, they didn't let them vote because they knew that, that we had the votes to sustain the veto. And uh, they put it back in committee, and the only thing we can think of maybe they try to smuggle it out as an amendment on some package that hoping that it would be something I couldn't veto. Landing line, I can veto powers, and I do. But, uh, Rest assured, I'm going to battle it to the end. I hope we had a kill. Can you imagine, Bill, how it comes through that you couldn't be done? That they could have had to come? Oh, I'm telling there you. are things that, yes, there are things like uh, really young, the deadline and having to extend the national deadline. And uh, you want to pass that or run the risk of uh, defaulting on your bonds, which would be so economically destructive worldwide. But, be trapped. Well, there's a lot of people who think that the bill is not the issue is really not being filed in court anyway. It could become law through some device of that sort. It's being challenged in court now anyway. So I might, that might join in the fight against it. They might say, I join in the fight against it. Well, we're impressed by the fact and depressed in a way that you're the first president in history. Uh, who has taken a specific action in favor of the defense of broadcasters' first amendment rights? There have been a lot of speeches made, but when it came, from, when push came to shove, this is the first time that we've ever had an action of this sort, which makes this such a, an historic occasion for us as well as for you in the country. I'm happy to remember back to those days and tell you the way it showed. That's where I first met you at a 
fiftieth anniversary of WHO in Des Moines. We were there. You were still there. The thing that you're concerned about the First Amendment for broadcasting would that apply also in an equal time law? Which is after all the things that you know about the equal time law. Well, today, right now, my Saturday broadcast, every Saturday, it's uh, the other side supposedly so responds to me, but they don't know what I'm going to say, <laughs> and they tape in advance their reply, <laughs> whether it fits or not. Do you like to see an elimination of the equal time law? Uh, well, I think I thought that was only now, there are two different issues. One is the equal opportunities provision, and the other, the fairness doctrine itself. Uh, so this doesn't deal with the political, the hard-nosed political situation of candidates having equal time. It just deals with the issue of controversial issues of the country. We're going to have to do some thought. It's quite a time. That's what you get for letting. Right. Oh, I did have another question. Do you, would your does your fairness doctrine codification veto apply to Sam Dobbs? Not here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Well, Mr. Hi, President, how are you, sir? See you. I'd like to introduce my wife, Diane. How do you do? It's nice to meet you. you. This is my son, Patrick. Hi. And my daughter, Mary. Mm -hmm. I think you and I are going over there to have a picture taken because of a little ceremony, and then after that, you will come in and join us mm -hmm. for a family Thank you. picture. For uh, Pat here. It's the award of the uh, Distinguished Superior Service Medal. To all who shall see these presents greetings, this is to certify that the Secretary of Defense has awarded the Defense Superior Service Medal to Commander Patrick W. Dunn, the United States Navy, for exceptionally meritorious service for the Armed Forces of the United States, given under my hand this day of 19 May, signed Secretary of Defense Casper W. Weinberger. The citation follows, sir. To Commander Patrick W. Dunn, United States Navy, he distinguished himself by exceptionally superior service as a naval aide to the President of the United States, White House, Washington, D.C., from June 1985 to June 1987. Commander Dunn continually displayed superior leadership, exemplary foresight, and tireless effort, which were of paramount importance to the President and the nation. In this highly visible position, he routinely planned and coordinated numerous events of national and international significance. His role as the Emergency Actions Officer for Presidential Travel was accomplished with expertise and professionalism. Commander Dunn served as the White House aide. His performance as the military coordinator for the 1986 Fourth of July Liberty Weekend and meetings with General Secretary Gorbachev in Iceland were credited upon himself, the United States Navy, and the Department of Defense. <laughs> No, sir. <laughs> well, we have a few souvenirs here now and then that you may be in, still be in civilian clothes at times. Thank you, sir. And a Jefferson cup. Thank you so much. And we thought that you two just might be able to use some some book bags. Oh, uh, Your school books. 
or anything else <laughs> that it might serve. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Well, we should go. Thank you. We appreciate it.
Gigi Goodwin, President, Senior. And Roman Gonzalez, Senior. No. Senior. Should we have a. Roman Gonzalez, Senior. No. President. Should we have a group photo here? With yes. yes.